Here is a nine step process to better Bible reading. First, don't assume everything applies to you. Imagine a new Christian wants to make sure he's applying the Bible correctly to his life. He decides to crack it open and just do what it says. The page lands on Ecclesiastes 10 and he reads, money is the answer for everything. Excited, he decides to flip to another page and get more cool advice. This time, it's Psalms. Delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Chapter 82, though, says, You are God's, Son of the Most High, all of you. With this new info, the new Christian decides he should live life for pleasure, gain as much money as possible, and relish in his new power as a new God. Obviously, that's not how it works. We can't assume that every Bible verse applies to us. In fact, the Bible as a whole doesn't really apply to us primarily. It's the story of God revealing himself to humanity through the nation of Israel and through the person of Jesus. Second, pay attention to context. Judge not lest you be judged. Now, that's a verse that does apply to us. But is that all it says? In reality, the Bible doesn't have any verses. They were put into the Bible later on to help us memorize it better, but the original texts were long scrolls or books meant to be read as a whole. That's what we have to do with every verse. Read the context. When Jesus continues this teaching, he says, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. He's advocating for people not to condemn their brothers, but to evaluate them. But we can't accurately evaluate our brothers if we're hypocrites. Third, identify genre. Literary context is great when trying to understand what individual verses mean, but there's another aspect to interpretation you can't miss, genre. Many parents are stressed when they raise children in a Christian home, and then those children fall away from the faith later on. Why? Because Proverbs says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. But that's an error in discerning the genre when they assume that that's going to be what happens. It's a proverb, not a promise. Proverbs are meant to express generally true things. Chapter 1 even says they're a source of words of insight, not decrees from God. In the Bible, we find historical narratives, letters, prophecies, laws, parables, psalms, gospels, apocalypses, genealogies, and even love songs. These can't all be read exactly the same way. Fourth, pay attention to history and culture, but don't use them to change the Bible to fit your preferences. The last portion of context within the Bible you have to recognize is history and culture. The Bible wasn't written in 2024. It's a collection of writings from over 40 authors spanning 1,500 years or more. There's an immense amount of history and culture wrapped up in it. For example, the Sadducees were temple leaders within the population of Israel. They were mostly pro-Roman, they only accepted the first five books of the Bible, and they didn't believe in the resurrection or the afterlife. So when you read that someone asked Jesus who a woman who's had seven husbands would be with in the afterlife, you have to remember it's the Sadducees asking, and that changes everything. They didn't believe in the afterlife, so they weren't looking for genuine answers. They were trying to test Jesus. Not only that, but knowing the history makes Jesus' response all the more impressive, since he responded to them using a quotation from Exodus, one of the first five books. But we also can't take those historical and cultural contexts and overemphasize them to the point where we distort the scripture. In some Christian circles, they suggest that Jesus is saying, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, refers to a real gate in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle. This gate was supposedly big enough for a human to walk through easily, but camels had to crouch down to make it through. Therefore, it's simply difficult for a rich person to get to heaven, not impossible. But there's actually no archaeological evidence for a gate like that. Perhaps the original suggestion came from someone who was uncomfortable with Jesus' warning against riches. He's saying it's impossible for rich people to get into heaven without God, not that it's just difficult. Fifth. Be aware of your presuppositions. Often we underemphasize our presuppositions, meaning that we don't realize how much our assumptions influence the way we interpret the text. When the disciples bring Jesus two swords in Luke 22, he says, that is enough. The actual intent of his words is unclear, but our assumptions can change how we view it. Anabaptist Christians who believe in pacifism would take his words as a rebuke, meaning something like, enough of that nonsense. Christians with military families might see it as a condoning of force, at least in some sense. We have to read scripture carefully, knowing that our backgrounds influence our interpretations. 
However, some people have the opposite problem of overemphasizing their presuppositions. They say that our assumptions and backgrounds exert so much influence on us that no one can ever be certain about what a passage of scripture really means. It's all up to our own interpretation. You have your truth and I have mine. Ironically, this is also a presupposition that cripples our ability to understand the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul comments on an earlier letter he had written in which he told the believers in Corinth not to associate with immoral people. Here he clarifies, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I was not including the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But I'm now writing you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother but is sexually immoral. Here, Paul is clarifying that he meant for believers not to associate with people who called themselves Christians but lived immoral sexual lives. He still wanted them to associate with unbelievers in order to spread the gospel. His clarification indicates that it is possible to arrive at a determinative meaning of his writings. That means it's possible to set aside presuppositions when reading the text and find out what it actually means. Do you remember earlier when I said there were nine steps to better Bible interpretation? Well, there's actually 10, and the last one is the most important, so stick around. We'll get there soon. Sixth, pay attention to patterns and themes when reading the Bible as one book, not many. Remember earlier when I also said that historical and cultural context was the last type of context we needed? Well, there's actually one more of those too. Canonical context. Any superhero movie fan nowadays will know that canonical things are those things that happen within the scope of the movie universe. Non-canonical things aren't legitimate parts of the story. The biblical canon includes the Old and New Testaments together. This means two important things, that the Bible interprets itself and that there are common themes that run throughout the book. The New Testament writers reference the Old Testament many times, and the Old Testament quoted itself as well. Many concepts from the Old Testament are brought into the New and interpreted for new audiences, but running throughout both Testaments are a few themes like redemption from slavery, the nation of Israel, and the coming of the Messiah. When you keep these in mind, it makes many verses make a lot more sense. 7. Don't read literalistically or mostly allegorically. But whenever you read the Bible, you'll ultimately get to some parts that just don't make sense when taken at face value. So the question is, are we supposed to read the Bible literally or not? And how do we know what to read literally and what to read metaphorically? In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, Crafty fellow that I am, I took you in by deceit. Is he admitting deception to his readers? Reading the previous chapters makes it clear that he's actually speaking sarcastically here. He spent a lot of writing space boasting about Christ and not himself, calling himself foolish and weak. Even the verses after his claim show that he was speaking with irony. But shouldn't we read the Bible literally? Well, yes, but there's a difference between literal reading and literalistic reading. Literal reading is the kind that tries to understand the intentions of the author by using the kinds of context clues we've already discussed. Literalistic reading is the kind that is woodenly literal, which ignores literary, historical, cultural, or canonical context, and instead isolates words and phrases apart from their setting. For example, that new Christian I mentioned at the start might be shocked if he continues in the Psalms and gets to chapter 137. Happy is the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. A literalistic approach would assume that the Bible is condoning the killing of children in this verse. The literal approach understands that there is a difference between descriptive and prescriptive verses. Descriptive verses describe a situation, while prescriptive ones are decrees from God to go do something. This verse is written in the middle of a curse against Babylon, where God is saying that others will rejoice when they kill the children of Babylon but the canonical context of the Bible makes it very clear God is very much against child sacrifice. As the saying goes, context saves lives. The other side of this coin from literal and literalistic reading is allegorical and metaphorical reading. Caution is important here as well, since not many things in the Bible are meant to be allegorical. Many modern misinterpretations of the Bible for whatever reason seem to come from verses that have to do with the Sea of Galilee. Here's a few examples. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Some people paraphrase this to say, 
Jesus can calm your life's storms. The allegory is storms equal difficult trials. But the reality is this isn't even about us. It's about Jesus' authority over nature. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of Peter. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? The paraphrase of this one is, when you start to sink, call out to Jesus. And the allegory is, sinking equals giving into your fears. But actually, this is also about Jesus' authority, not about us. When Jesus arrived on the other side, in the region of the Gadarenes, he was met by two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? In the distance, a large herd of pigs was feeding. So the demons begged Jesus, If you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. Go, he told them. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and died in the waters. Those tending the pigs ran off into the town and reported all this, including the account of the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. So the paraphrase of this one is, drown your demons in the sea. The allegory being that demons equal your fears, and drowning them is totally getting rid of your fears. But the reality is, yet again, Jesus' authority over demons this time, not about us. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. Master, Simon replied, We have worked hard all night without catching anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. The paraphrase of this last one is, To catch fish, you have to cast a net. The allegory being, casting a net is sharing the gospel and catching fish is converting people. As nice as that sounds, yet again, this is also a passage about the authority of Jesus, not about any humans other than him. It should be obvious by this point that certain passages exist within scripture that we shouldn't take allegorically, as much as we'd like to. Eight, let the Bible set its own agenda. Now, the criterion that most people nowadays will be painfully familiar with, agendas. But people aren't the only ones with agendas. Books have them too, and the Bible is no exception. You can see where I'm going with this. Let the Bible set its own agenda and don't insert your own. A benign example. Many people use Philippians 4.13 in and around sporting events, as it seems to be an uplifting verse about perseverance. I can do all things through God who strengthens me. But this verse isn't talking about victory in sport or battle for that matter. Paul lived a very tough life and came very close to death many times. In the previous verses, he's writing about his ability to live in abundance and in scarcity. It's easy to read this verse as, God has given me the strength to win this game. But what it should be interpreted as is, God has given me the strength to deal with winning or losing. We don't like to lose, so we insert our own agenda into the verse. Many people don't like what the Bible says about morality, authority, life and death, sexuality, or many other things, so they insert their own agendas. But here's a quick overview of the agenda the Bible lays out for itself. God is holy, righteous, and alone. There is no other God but Him. God makes covenants and keeps them. Sin needs atonement. God has established a new community of believers in Jesus and tasked them with spreading the gospel message. Jesus is coming again to judge the world. 9. Become a believer so you can fully understand the spiritual aspects of the Bible. This criterion is one that non-believers may not fully grasp. Actually, the Bible says so. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. And this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The natural man does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man judges all things, but he himself is not subject to anyone's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 
The natural person is someone who is not chosen to believe in and trust in Christ for their salvation. This is not saying that non-believers can't understand the grammar of a sentence or flow of an idea in the text, nor is it saying that they can't understand historical or cultural settings. Canonical context is even open for anyone to understand who is willing to look for it. What this passage is saying is that non-believers cannot accept the things taught by the Spirit, discern their importance, and accurately judge how to apply them to life. This is something that is granted to us when God gives us his Holy Spirit, which gives us a new mindset, helps us overcome sin, conform to God's word, confirms that we are his children, and gives us peace, hope, and joy, among a bunch of other things. The new believers don't automatically understand the paragraphs within the Bible better than the non-believers, but they know the truth of it by their experience. This is called the witness of the Holy Spirit. It serves as witness to the truth of Scripture. As a side note, the only moral thing a believer can do that an atheist can't do is to properly love and serve God. That also comes from the Holy Spirit. 10. Read the Bible. Read it a lot. You'd be surprised how many people bring up arguments against the Bible having never actually read it, or at least not that in depth. Maybe they'll just find an article online and parrot the thing that they've been told before. Think about the passage we were talking about earlier, judge not lest you be judged. How many people do you think actually read that passage? Probably not a lot. So, read it. A lot. <laughs>